Dr. Fellis uh, has so many achievements, I want to make sure that I actually get the details correct here. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Uh, Patrick Fellis to visit us here at Yale. He's a French orthodontist who's dedicated 45 years of his life to improving myofunctional and pediatric orthodontics. Before working at the University Hospital of Robert Debray in Paris, he started the mentorship of Professor Defez, I'm gonna mess, yes. I'm, yeah, yes. and Professor Delaire, yeah. and focused on an understanding of the deformities etiology, the causes of these airway anomalies. He started a lecture and published in 1977, and he's one of the founders of the International Functional Association, and is the founding president of the French Pediatric Orthodontic Society and the International Pediatric Orthodontic Society. The latest e-Congress organized under his presidency reunited 4,500 specialists from all over the world around the theme of early treatments. In 2012, he summarized his experience to create a new simple device that was missing in his, his practice, the froggy mouth. I'm not sure if there's a French pronunciation of that or not. Um, the French Ministry of Health knighted Dr. Fellas, the Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, oh. <laughs> uh, for his work. Yes, yes, yes. Personally, I think we need to do better in the prevention and management of airway issues in small children. Doing so has the potential to make a big impact in the lives of our children, both at the time of the intervention and when they get older. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Fellas here at Yale, and thank you so much for coming, sir. Oh, You've come a long way. Thank you for the University of Yale, for Craig, for uh, Mayor, uh, to uh, to be interested by uh, our conversation, uh, we met uh, in New York a few years ago, and uh, we met in Paris uh, six months ago. And he says, "Ah, but I did not know you have done so." Uh, so it's uh, I am very pleased, and it's so nice uh, university. Not uh, it's famous, but. For me, the best thing is so nice to, to live here, to have uh, this thing. Uh, so it's, one, so it's, it's wonderful to have you here. Yes. Our neurosciences uh, and the brain uh, physiology uh, enable us to change uh, the orofacial anatomy. Uh, the learning uh, objective of this uh, presentation is to introduce the different ways to improve swallowing to discover a new approach to restore nasal breathing and a myofunctional balance, to understand the associated unconscious physiological and biochemical change in the brain, and uh, at least uh, to be able uh, to use uh, this uh, method uh, on uh, your patient. There is some basic concept we will go quickly. Uh, but I must uh, remember that uh, we have the inconscious ability to coordinate a movement to make it meaningful and effective. In my vocabulary, I call that a praxis, but Mayor Frigger says praxis does not mean anything in English, uh, so we change <laughs> the word. But, uh, and, uh, this coordination is controlled by a set of neurons, we are connected at the level of a synapse and where alternating electrical and biochemical processes from the originating uh, neuron through intermediate neurons. It can be uh, four, ten, and two millions to the uh, destination neurons. And uh, the system uh, would be, in reality, a vast network of knowings grouped together by a mechanism of inhibition and activation. And we must know that the functional balance is not a stable state, but a state in perpetual reorganization. The information <coughs> is constantly analyzed and generally ignored very quickly, but it can lead to an unconscious anoetic reorganization if it is re uh, relevant. And it's important because when you treat a children, the treatment is never finished. It can have research <coughs> for different results. So you can just, it's not enough to join what you wanted to, but you must uh, take care 
uh, that uh, the functional balance uh, will be uh, reorganized correctly during uh, all uh, the post treatment. And I use also a word I like very much, and uh, it's rather difficult also to understand, is anoetic. And uh, Telving uh, has the definition for anoetic memories that is expressed without consciousness directly to action. Uh, it's for me an opposition of uh, cortical uh, control. <laughs> Uh, the anoetic control is in the brain stem, in the low uh, and um, we must know that also the reinforcement of an existing neural circuit or the integration of a new information make it possible to ensure proper orofacial functioning. So uh, we will look what happens when everything does well. Uh, at birth, the control of the motor skin of a newborn is carried out at the level of the brain stem. And uh, we are surprised in the newborn by the contrast between the overall incoordination of movement and the perfect harmony that governs the mobility of the lips, the tongue, the pharynx when sucking and swallowing. And uh, the neurophysical control of the motor activity of a stomach is synchronized with the respiratory, cardiac, and digestive function. The sucking program controls the swallowing and the posture by a reflex action. So what happens when the baby swallows? The mandibule is stab stabilized by the contraction of facial muscles. This uh, thing is really important because uh, the mandible must be stabilized. We can see uh, later that uh, the good stabilization is the occlusion. But uh, when there is no tip, it was the facial muscle that uh, obtained this uh, stabilization. The saliva is swallowed by the pressure difference between the anterior mouth and the posterior mouth. And as soon as the nipple of a bottle come into contact with the mouth, the newborn takes the lips and produces an intrabuccal vacuum with back and forth movement of the tongue that act as a suction pump and trigger the pharyngeal phase. Ideally, the tongue will create a suction with a nipple against the palate. The tongue completely fills the bottle cavity and establish contact between lip and uh, the lateral part of a cheek and between the anterior part and the labial mucous membrane. And uh, for the suction deglutition, it requires a seal at the lips, which is generally obtained by the contraction of the lips, which is controlled by the facial nerves. So what happened when the diet changed? The change of the diet will progressively introduce a cortical activity into the deglutition pro pro programmer's control. The secondary orality implies the state of maturation in the motor and plastic parietal and frontal cortical area in the brain. Innate behavior are partially replaced by program that takes experience and learning into account. But they coexist with a primary feeding for a certain uh, amount of pain. Initially reflex, the behavior becomes unconscious, automatic. And the neurological command and the neurological control center for swallowing and sucking are different. Up <coughs> to about the age of four, this pattern is called primary swallowing. The secondary swallowing appears around four. <coughs> but around this age, there is a new mechanism of swallowing which naturally take place for 60% of the children when mastications appear. It was all secondary swallowing. 
uh, when the mastication <coughs> appears, the uh, nerve growth factor increases in the saliv salivary gland, promoting the neurogenesis and the formation of new synapses. There was also uh, epidermal growth factor who increase in the parotid and the submaxillary gland, and brain-derived neurotrophic factors increase in the hippocamp. When it takes place, the new myofunctional balance will inhibate the action of the fascial nerves and activate the trigeminal one, which will favor an homorphic growth of the face. When this work is done naturally, there is new synapse who are created and which will create a new circuit. Uh, it was uh, the travel of uh, Eric Gondel, Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2000 for its work on the memory. And he showed this plasticity will be achieved ever by gradually a reorganization of existing program or by created new ones. The new sensory information will go up <coughs> to the sensory motor by a bottom-up road and will constitute a new neuronal circuit that will control the new uh, motor program. Is it genetic or epigenetic? The potential for changing this behavior comes from the brain and is controlled by genetics. However, endogenous or innate factors only produce option possibilities. And uh, I like uh, this uh, comparison uh, this, uh, to distinguish uh, the epigenetic and the genetic. The genetic is the partition of the five uh, symphony of Beethoven. But if you give this genetic information to five different orchestra, you will have five different concerts, and that is uh, epigenetic. Uh, it's rather difficult. P. Mendelis says the neurons are not enslaved by its gene. The gene will not be expressed unless the adequate exogenous condition arrives and arrives at the right time. That's important because which is normal around four, which be more difficult uh, at uh, 10 or at 12, and more and more difficult for adults. Uh, Don't own church says genes are activated or deactivated by our belief, our emotion, and our attitude. We have a great, a great uh, possibility for changing uh, the growth pattern. And what is the influence of fascial growth? By the muscular forces it generated, it will promote optimal growth of the jaw, and all this without having to do exercise. That's why 50% uh, of the children will uh, have a functional and an aesthetic occlusion without the need of an orthodontic treatment. But if the primary swallowing remains after the appearance of the molars, it will interfere with a normal growth and the function that was functional before sucking swallowing before becomes dysfunctional and will lead to dysmorphosis. What are the main causes uh, of uh, continued uh, sucking uh, swallowing? Uh, Professor Cooley noticed that uh, the maintenance of uh, intake by sucking in the child maintained a certain delay in the sitting up of a mastication process. And why? But sometimes uh, the child never had the opportunity to discover mastication and this, this, this new mode of functioning. Uh, generally, uh, it's a problem uh, of uh, two uh, soft food, uh, two bottles, uh, and uh, uh, nutrients we don't need uh, mastication. Sometimes the child has discovered it, but the limbic system 
mandatory passage for the engram of a new program had not returned it for general uh, psychological reason. Yes, uh, it's a good uh, good way uh, to swallow, but uh, I like uh, my uh, what I do actually. Uh, passive verb, thumb, uh, sucking, the bottle. Uh, I don't want to change, and uh, doc, uh, we don't use this new information. We uh, go to the uh, corbeil. <laughs> Uh, and the third one was the anatomi anatomical environment, uh, which uh, already too deformed to allow the uh, implementation of the new program. Uh, and there is uh, abnormal anatomy uh, which uh, prevents uh, the modification of the dysfunction. Of course, when you can see uh, the narrow uh, upper maxilla, uh, it's impossible uh, for uh, the tongue to be against the palate. When you have a, such an open bite, it's impossible to prevent uh, the synapsis kinesi, between the tongue and uh, the lips. Uh, in uh, prognathium mandibular also, uh, the tongue is low, so uh, the mandibule must uh, put uh, forward, and uh, there is stimulation uh, of the condyle uh, bones, uh, and the upper maxilla is so narrow, so uh, the tongue has no room upper and stay uh, down. So there is a lot of uh, reason, and it's very important that uh, anatomical environment is compatible with the new function. And these patients are a good candidate uh, for uh, early orthodontic treatment. And uh, I'm uh, fond of uh, orthodontic, early orthodontic treatment because uh, it's much more than uh, occlusal, than dental aesthetic. And when you can see this girl, we don't want to go to school, she has problem with her friends, uh, etc. And you just try to change his posture, uh, to stimulate uh, the breathing, to stimulate the upper maxilla, you can see a change very, very quickly. And the change is not only uh, oral, dental, it's all the development, uh, the future uh, of uh, the children. This girl also dysmorphophobic, uh, the children call them the pig, pig, the pig. And uh, in uh, one year, we have completely changed his aesthetic, completely changed his face, and uh, resolved uh, the scholar problem. With this open bite, it's difficult, and if you treat it correctly, uh, before the new teeth arrive, you have corrected uh, the occlusion. But there is a constant in all these dysmorphoses, is the need of a seal at the level of the lips, which is controlled by the activity of the facial nerves. For uh, the 40% of subjects uh, we had uh, for ADP genetic uh, reason, uh, the old circuit uh, persists and become dysfunctional. And there is another reason which is frequently uh, given, the maintenance of the mouth breathing. Nasal breathing is uh, that of a newborn, but during uh, rhinopharyngeal problems, Metacircuits were created, initially temporarily, but which have become automated and replace or complete the physiological breathing. Many practitioners uh, make the respiratory uh, rehabilitation a priority. We will come back uh, to this. Over, we'll start with a classic uh, rehabilitation uh, of uh, anatomical environment and uh, uh, deglutition and tongue posture. So <coughs> when we are in these cases, what can we do? We must remember we never change the things by fighting, fighting the existing reality. To change some things, we must build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So what are the solutions? Uh, I 
call the solution for orthodontists because uh, I am not a sleep doctor. Uh, I am just an orthodontic, so I can give you my uh, way to treat. But uh, for the orthodontics, uh, the first, uh, the first because it was more easy, uh, is waiting and hoping. And uh, Pimanidis uh, talk about this approach in uh, his book, The Neurobiology of uh, Orthodontics. And lots of uh, orthodontics uh, in the United States don't take care uh, of the function. They say, oh, my treatment will be enough uh, efficient, but the modification will appear alone, like it's appeared naturally uh, around uh, four years old. But you have more chance to obtain that changing if you take care of that if you don't take care. Uh, the trainers are also uh, well used. Uh, it, they have been recommended by Farrell in Australia and by Bergensen in the United States. And they are very frequently prescribed, but wearing them all night and two hours during the days is rarely respected by the patient and especially with the young uh, children. And uh, I think it disrupts the quality of the sleep, which is so important to consolidate the learning at school. Uh, when we sleep, we encode in our memory what we uh, learn during the days. We are not learning something new. There is a lot of travel, uh, uh, Jouvet, Einstein, Dehan, Albuy, they said the sleep is a consolidation to the repartition of a new program, of a new chose, but we don't uh, learn everything. And we can see with uh, MRI uh, that uh, during the night there is a reactiving uh, uh, activity, uh, the same uh, as uh, happened uh, during learning in the motor cortex, in the uh, hippocampus, in cerebellum, why uh, it uh, degrees in certain uh, parietal and temporal or frontal area. We can say the sleep facilitates automatization, but the sleeping brain learns practically nothing during the night. The third one is the use of uh, paramedical rehabilitation specialists. Generally, it's a speech therapist uh, in France. Uh, uh, and uh, the oral uh, facial myofunctional therapist will set up a strategy by a cortical way to enable the imprinting of a, a good uh, function. Uh, the patient must become aware of the gesture that he usually car carries out, and then the gesture that he must carry out until the repetition enables the action to become automatic. We are in the top-down uh, approach, where the orders start from the cortical part and descend toward the motor effectors. Is it efficient or no? The most experienced myofunctional therapists themselves admit that it's a long and uh, it is a difficult path. Uh, and we can uh, see that it's not enough to know what you have to do to be able to do it. Uh, I try uh, and I have long uh, golf lesson uh, and the teacher show me but uh, to enter in uh, my brain and in my automatism, it was very difficult. It was the same for seeing. So uh, it's not because you know that you can do. And uh, how uh, the biochemistry contributes to it and how we can use it. The top-down synaptic modification we obtain in these cases. <coughs> Eric Gandel show that there is an increase of the neurotransmitters in the synapse. This slight stimulation releases neurotransmitters in the synapse, but the nucleus is not involved. We are in the short time memory. You can see on this diagram there is uh, excitation uh, on the neurotransmitter, uh, generally the glutamate. Uh, but uh, 
if uh, you uh, go to your lesson and come back uh, one week uh, later, uh, you have uh, forgotten uh, everything. And this approach uh, is a time cost and uh, requires a significant modification. Uh, only closed and prolonged exercise can modify the coding of a neural nucleus and transfer the information to long-term memory by a structural modification of a neuronal surface. The failure rate is high. What the 60% of children who change their program naturally did not need exercise. And we don't forget that a third of adults are still dysfunctionally swallowing and uh, can uh, hardly uh, follow a protocol that uh, interferes uh, too much with their activity. And uh, I think for sleep apnea it's uh, very important uh, because if uh, you ask your patient uh, to uh, go, uh, the, the protocol we have been made, uh, it's uh, quite uh, one hour of exercise uh, each day and uh, during uh, several, uh, several weeks. Uh, when this existed, uh, there is repeated stimulation in the short amount of time. A dialogue will be created between the synapse and the nucleus in order to activate the Krebs and produce a new protein necessary for shifting from short time memory to long time memory. There is inhibition of a Krebs 2, stimulation of a Krebs 1 and uh, the neurotransmitter uh, is done. Uh, the dialogue is, uh, the synapse says, oh, I have too much uh, exercise to do. Uh, I will not have enough uh, glutamate, so uh, please uh, find a new uh, neurotransmitter that uh, I don't need to repeat uh, this exercise each time. And uh, this new protein, which uh, is CPUB, uh, which come uh, after the glutamate and can be considered as a prion, not a pathologic prion, but it will ensure a permanent transmission of the message. But there is another way to store a long time memory, which is a biochemical way. A highly emotional moment can bypass the normal constraint of a produce and produce enough MAP kinase molecules that are sent to the nucleus to inactivate CREP2 and facilitate the activation of CREP1 to directly store the experience in the long time memory. If you had a car crash 10 years ago, you will always remember that it was the Christmas uh, night, you are dealing to your parents, uh, it was raining, you are with the two babies, uh, it, and you never need to repeat it during one month, all the circumstances to can remember at each moment. When there is this production of MAP kinase, everything is print, even what you don't take care, but which is in the long time memory. But there is condition for that. Uh, and it was uh, Joel's and his collaborators, we uh, highlighted the factor that the stress facilitates the mechanism of a memory only when it was faint at the moment when the organism has to memorize the event and only when the hormone and the neurotransmitter activate the same network activated by the learning. And it's very essential uh, that there are these conversions in the time and space between learning and the cause uh, of the stress. So we are going to speak to Frogimov. Frogimov is a device which is uh, worn around 15 minutes a day during a short period of time and uh, for the child is in front of the TV screen. First, uh, it's a reward which is recognized by the limbic system, but uh, he uh, puts the head in the good position, so uh, the regard is horizontal, the tongue is horizontal, 
and it's more easy to swallow when the tongue is horizontal. But if you are reading a book and the saliva uh, go, uh, so the child is facing a contradiction, an impossibility, a question, because it will force him to reorganize his previous naive and complete knowledge, his dysfunction. Because if there is no seal, and the uh, appliance prevents the seal, it's impossible to have sucking deglutition because you need a seal. And so if you can have the seal, you can swallow with your habitual uh, program. So there is a panic, panic in the brainstem because it's very important, it's vital uh, to uh, swallow. And so the child has few seconds, a few minutes, to find a new way to swallow, and uh, that will be uh, uh, generally the good uh, swallowing program. Um, as I say, uh, as in no longer being able to close the lips, it will is impossible to uh, to have, to use the swallowing program. Uh, the labial seal is necessary to proceed to the primary swallowing. And uh, Frogimov inhibited the action of the fascial nerves. And this will allow the trigeminal nerves to control, uh, to be active, and control the molar occlusion. When you are in occlusion, this will bring the lingual dome closer to the bony palate, and a simple contraction of the stiloglosses then uh, will allow to discovery the secondary swallowing. And this new program will immediately become part of the implicit memory, memory that is not related to any previous learning, which does not require repetition to be preserved, and whose recall requires no conscious attention. These implicit memories are stored in the cerebellum the striatum and the amygdala. And I will show you, because uh, it was very important for me, one of the first patients was uh, a child with a cerebral palsy uh, with a problem of swallowing, which caused uh, the pulmonary aspiration and have required uh, intensive care. Uh, we put the first time the floating off. And look the stress in the eyes. Uh, ah, I must swallow, I must swallow, but I can't. What, what I will do? So that's because of pooling secretions in the mouth? So like, like the child is struggling to swallow the secretions? Yes. <clears throat> and two weeks later, he can swallow and I think with a speech therapist in two weeks with a church child, it's quite impossible to change uh, the, the, the program. And look, the eyes are completely different. And the mother says, oh, the most difficult thing for me is to take off the appliance mm -hmm. uh, because he was so comfortable uh, with uh, it, he don't want. And uh, when I saw this, it was one of the first uh, uh, appliance I put, I said, hmm. I think it's a free and that's what led me to uh, neuroscience because I want to understand what, uh, what happened. And uh, we have a change uh, to have the access of uh, MRI, a functional MRI, uh, and uh, we have a, a very interesting uh, uh, information. Uh, it was a girl, she was seven years old, she was in the machine at rest and at, at the end of one minute she swallowed. And we can see uh, the stimulation of the uh, area who control the deglutition. And immediately in the machine, for the first time, we put the frogging off. And you can see that the first deglutition has a stimulate other place and a much large area of a sensitive and motor area, we control uh, the, uh, the modification, the, uh, the motor action. Uh, and there was a very interesting um, 
study by, by uh, Fabio Scopa in Roma, we have studied uh, the difference uh, uh, of activation between the two um, uh, types of uh, deglutition, and we proved that the good subordinary deglutition is more comfortable and more economical, and so it will be chosen by the brain stem because it's a better uh, action. And briefing. Um, because briefing is very important also, and uh, the rehabilitation should not only concern the tongue, but all the oral facial praxis and the restoration of a nasal briefing is essential for the uh, sustainability of this functional acquisition. The tongue is a part of the respiratory organ. It's impossible to treat swallowing and oral praxis without a restoration of a nasal breathing. It was a famous picture, which is not uh, in the good part, because when you have a nasal respiratory, the tongue can be entering in the mouth, stimulate the growth of the mouth, and inhibit the uh, mouth breathing. If you have a uh, mouth breathing, you must have uh, leave the air to enter, so the uh, tongue go down and will not be in a good position to stimulate, and we uh, emphasize uh, the uh, this uh, function. Oh. It's rather easy. Uh, to see if uh, you have uh, nasal breathing. It's uh, enough to look uh, the nasal orifice to know uh, and to see if they are uh, functional. And the tongue posture, so uh, on this uh, picture, you can see uh, if you have more breathing, the tongue is low, the mouth is open, and the air go through the mouth. If you close the teeth, the tongue up rise against the palate. It's very easy to swallow because there is a, just a contraction of the stylogloss and the air go through the nose. So the tongue posture is the best inhibition for uh, mouth breathing. And this interference, interaction between deglutition and respiration are uh, obvious. Uh, we must not forget that they have a common origin, uh, the two uh, anatomic frameworks, was before the stomodeum, and uh, there is communication between the nose and the mouth. And since the trigeminals control uh, the breathing center uh, in the pointing tegmentum through its sensory nucleus, it will promote a restoration of the nasal breathing allowing the tongue to adopt an eye posture and a posterior part against the roof of the mouth. We must say one thing is important. The physiological seal we inhib the mouth respiration is not at, at the level of the labial, but at the lingual. And there, is, there was a lot of uh, re-indicators. We say at the beginning, close the lip. And when you close the lip by activating uh, the facial nerves, you are wrong from the, the, the beginning. So it's impossible uh, to have the good de development. Uh, we must uh, inhibit the facial nerve and obtain the uh, stimulation of the trigeminal nerves. Uh, all the other neural uh, circuits that are controlling the orofacial function may thus be affected thanks a communication between these different networks. And this role is assigned to the glial cells, which are far uh, or four, uh, four or five times more numerous than the neuron, and both roles are essential in normal. Uh, at the beginning, uh, people say uh, neurons are the most important, and they, we say a neuron, it's muscular. 
and cellular glials are feminine. Cellular glials is just to bring the food to the neuron, to clean the round, uh, to, but now we know that the glial cells are more important uh, than uh, the, the neurons. And uh, how it works around the synapse, the glial cells pick up the conversation, like a telephone tap, and will broadcast the information to all the other neural circuits via the gliotransmitter, as if in information were broadcasting by radio to all the circuits and allow the other circuits uh, that were not uh, first involved in the rehabilitation process to take advantage of this information and to improve the efficacy. Of you are, uh, when you change in education, you send a message at the synapse. It's like a phone uh, conversation. And round, there is the glial cells we are uh, studying and mm -hmm. say, oh, it's interesting. They are not uh, put the tongue in the same way that uh, the other time. Maybe I can give the information to the other uh, program for uh, respiratory, uh, for uh, libera uh, ear, uh, for so on. So, uh, all the programs are connected with the information and can have their own modification without the attention of the cortex by an analytic uh, system. And uh, this mechanism can also strengthen the nasal respiratory. And I was used uh, to uh, ask the children during two or three days to have uh, respiratory uh, to uh, uh, smell uh, perfume, vinegar, and so. But uh, because uh, if the learning have stimulated several cerebral areas and created so several neuronal circuits, the activation of one of them will activate the others. And the olfactory areas are the oldest in the brain and many of its other structures has developed around it. And the most important information is that the transport, uh, transport of information from the nasal epithelia via the trigeminal is considerably slower than the transport from the olfactive epithelium. It's very difficult to ask the child to breathe from us because the air does not smell anything and there is not a stimulation uh, of a sensitive area. If there is smell, it will print, and you will have the double modification by uh, the, uh, na the na nasal breathing uh, network and by uh, the uh, olfactory uh, system. Oh, but this imprint, it's not enough uh, and is not uh, enough uh, because we just treat the print of a new program. But uh, it's not enough. And if we have a new program, you may, we must use it. We must uh, take attention that it become automatic. And uh, if you stop the re-education just uh, too uh, short, you just can have a repetition of a good gesture, but it will not go to the automation. And it was like a computer. Uh, when you buy uh, your child, uh, you buy it with a program from uh, sucking uh, deputation. And oh, you heard that there is a better program around for. So it can be charged by internet, or you can buy it, and you put it on your computer. And so you will have two icons, two programs to do the same thing. But if you click on the old uh, icone, you will call the old program, even if you have a bone. So it's very important to learn the child to click on the good icon. And the primary swallowing icon is triggered by the activation of the facial nerves. My lips are contracted, my teeth are not touching each other. If you, the child is in, in this posture, when he needs to swallow what, once a minute, he will trigger the old program. The good icon is my lips are relaxed and my molar are in occlusion. 
and this dominant action of a trigeminal nerve, which allow uh, not only the molar occlusion, but also the protection of the tongue from being beaten. Lips are now the key point of our vagutition. Uh, for finish, uh, I must uh, speak about the inhibition, because uh, the inhibition is more and more important in the, these uh, processes. And learning is not only about the ability to produce a behavior that was unknown to us, it's also a process that aims to inhibit automatic mental process. It was um, Pierre-Marie Ledo, I think it's rather new also in the United States, uh, and uh, it's confirmed uh, what uh, Daniel Kahneman has wrote uh, and, shows, and when he described two systems, the system one that dominates our thinking via unconscious cognitive automatism, and the system two, which is a reflexive system, which uh, can uh, uh, control certain automatism of a system one and replacing it, but uh, at the cost of a conscious and a slower effort. And Dr. Daniel Kahneman Kahn 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 was Nobel Prize in economy, uh, but uh, he was well known for this description of a system one, system two. And Olivier Houdet adds a third system, inhibitor of a system one, whose epicenter is located in the inferior frontal gyros, and with much intervention to allow the system two to, to be put in place. For, in, for example, when you swallow, you are in system one. When you have, uh, when you have uh, a re-education of a deglutition, it's in, in system two. But to uh, ensure that the system two motor uh, is effective, we must inhibit the system one. And uh, in reality, which is very interesting with Frogimov, is that Frogimov modifies the program, the networks in the system one, because he is analytic, and uh, it will be the concept of comfort that will give the priority to the new program. When you are top-down re-education, you have the program in system two, and you must inhibit the system one. When you learn with Frogimov, you are in the system one and you don't need this inhibition. So, just a way to control the effectiveness of our re-education. And the best element uh, that we can tell us that is uh, a new processes are automated is a careful study of phonation. And it's very important, uh, Cooley says, the coexisting of sucking and screaming, chewing and spoken language, seem to demonstrate the intricacy of the verbal and food orality. This correlation between food orality and verbal orality is reinforced by the fact that the anatomical pathways are analogous but viewed in reverse. And there is just a simple exercise. Uh, we ask to, uh, we ask the child to count and you look where is the tongue. If the tongue is inside the, the mouth, you don't see the tongue. That means that uh, the, the lips are uh, it, uh, control the elocution. And if the lips control the elocution, when you need to swallow, the tongue can swallow and it's very easy. But if you uh, uh, have uh, the uh, elocution uh, with the tongue. Uh, if uh, the tongue uh, is uh, outside uh, the uh, heart cards, when you need to swallow, you can enter the tongue, close the mouth, uh, speak and uh, open the mouth and put the tongue outside. But it's more easy to use the suction deglutition. So it's the best way to know if you have the good automatization through this source. It's impossible to do the same thing at the same time with the same organ. If you elocutate with uh, the lip, you swallow with the tongue. If you swallow with the lip, you elocutate with uh, the tongue.
Well, I don't know if uh, you are interesting <laughs> by uh, this was, there was a study and there was a lot of study in Italia, in Belgium, and so, but uh, we, uh, in less than uh, 10 uh, weeks, uh, we uh, have uh, between uh, 60 and 80 percent of uh, realization. Uh, 60 percent re-education and automatization. 20 percent uh, are re-educated, but not yet automatized. And there is 20 percent that uh, don't uh, answer a good answer to this type of re-education. Okay, but we have shown these shows. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention and. Uh, uh, I am here for uh, to answer if uh, you have question. Uh, if you have question, it's good. You have understood. If we have no question, I don't think uh, I am so uh, so performance. Uh, that means you will not understand and if you want to leave. Okay. I, I, I have a lot of questions actually. Um, I. I um, I'm curious, first of all, if you've looked at uh, measures of obstructive sleep apnea in your patients before and after use of your froggy mouth device. I think, but I have no experience, uh, but I think it could be very interesting uh, to use it, uh, but if we need a cohort, uh, we need uh, students, <laughs> Uh, we need a uh, hospital. No, I am retreated. Uh, I have no uh, exercise. But I am sure there is something to, and I will be very pleased if uh, any uh, uh, university. To, to answer also a little bit here, and that my father was specialized in autonautics, and when he started to get interested about uh, obstructive sleep apnea, he was already retired and not treating many patients. What really gave him the will to work with the sleep specialist is the meeting with Christian Guimino. Uh, when they had a big, dis big discussion, because Christian uh, explained him and showed him uh, an article, I think that he was writing with Camacho about that, showing the efficiency of rehabilitating the briefing to uh, decrease the uh, sleep apnea index I know it was 50% 50 per, uh, 50 on adults and 62% on uh, children. So what my father is ba basically saying about the sleep apnea is that he is no one to say that uh, changing the breathing pattern is having an impact on the sleep apnea. Other people said it, and especially Christian Guimino, that's why he started to work with the sleep specialist. He says, what he says, he, he says, is that he, he says I think the best uh, treatment for uh, medium uh, sleep apnea is myofunctional re-education. I said, I don't know, but I know myofunctional re-education and I can have better uh, results by an anaotic uh, way by uh, that uh, top-down re-education. And so that's the link. Uh, <laughs> I wish some <laughs> I think it's also really one that. of the next steps that there is some universities that are having the ability to assess the sleep apnea index are able then to make a deeper study on what's the exact impact of the device with the sleep apnea index. What we know is that the device for mouth is having this impact on the briefing and is having between 60 and 90 percent of success rate in rehabilitation of the briefing without the additional exercises. If you add additional exercises, this rate increase. And that some people prove that changing the briefing patterns then has the impact on the index. The link between the froggy and the index still need to be proven. And that's why also we are doing all of that. I just make a little interruption for the people that follows us in the chat that they may ask their question online and I will ask them to Dr. Felus. Because I'm kind of curious too, I was very interested in the case you presented the child with cerebral palsy. Because a lot of the children that we see with a very high arched palate, open bite, they may have issues like cerebral palsy or, or Down syndrome as well. Um, and they can be challenging to treat um, with traditional methods like adenotonsillectomy, et cetera. Um, I know you mentioned cerebral palsy. Have you looked at children with Down syndrome? Yes, uh, so it has a good, very good results. Uh, 
Uh, it was the first, uh, the first uh, person we have treated with good results. So it was, uh, was Fischer Brandes uh, in Munich. Uh, and uh, he stimulated uh, the Hirsch uh, uh, appliance. Uh, it's like a uh, sucette uh, with a row and he stimulate the stylogloss. And uh, when uh, I uh, treat, I have some cases, uh, I uh, stimulate uh, the stylogloss. Uh, immediately the tongue enter. And so it's uh, very important for the pa parents because for social ability, it's both important that the tongue is inside. And uh, which is very interesting is that I not notice when they are treated very early, no treat uh, class three prognathism. So the prognathism, the class three is uh, not in the syndrome. It's not the Down syndrome. It's a consequence of a dysfunction obtained by the tongue. Uh, the tongue is not very often too big. It's well, bad reorganization, but uh, it's very rare that is a very uh, big uh, tongue. It's, the tongue look big, <coughs> uh, are often outside, but uh, we can reorganize the, the contraction of a muscle and have the tongue entire uh, in the mouth. So by class three uh, Down syndromes have never uh, have, have been corrected uh, naturally without any appliance. Mm. Yeah, we also then had some of our users that were treating patients with Down syndrome. Once again, my father was already retired when uh, we started the big Fragma of uh, Adventure, so he was only having a few patients like the one with the cerebral palsy. I was then me having feedbacks of the other users that were also treating uh, patients with Down syndrome. I think that the first stuff and most important to say is that like for any devices, the compliance is the key and having the compliance of a patient with Down syndrome is never easy. What we may say is that it is often easier to get a good compliance when the device that you wear is non-invasive, has to be worn during a pleasant activity and only 15 minutes per day at the opposite of a lot of different kind of rehabilitation but that's still a constraint of having something between the lips. So to have an efficient rehabilitation, we need the compliance, which is the biggest challenge with the patient with Down syndrome. What Froggy does is having the easiest way to get the compliance, but there is no 100% success rate for that. When they are treated early, also, uh, two years, three years, uh, if you have a Down syndrome, so Maybe you can be helped uh, by a uh, froggy mouth, uh, but generally you need an orthodontic treatment to correct the class three. Mm -hmm. I say we don't need uh, orthodontic uh, treatment when you begin very early. And uh, for all the cases I show you, that's a very early uh, treatment. Uh, but of course, uh, when you wait too long, uh, it's more difficult uh, to change uh, the, the function because uh, you know there is there is a um, uh, window uh, to have a good uh, modification and easy modification and there was uh, these experiences of uh, children we have been uh, educated by monkeys uh, during the two year, two first years I never can uh, speak because uh, the speech area has not been uh, solicited uh, at the right moment. And it's very important to do the, the things, but to try to do it at the right moment. We have a question in the chat too. Um, Valerie was asking if you could explain how watching the child's tongue when counting will indicate when rehabilitation is complete. Yeah. It was wondering if you could show that slide again. I was curious about that too. Yes, but you, you don't because. You, oh. Yes. Up. Can you describe what you're seeing when yes. you're watching I, this? I see the tongue on the, on the, the, the. 
the difficulty is, is that the sounds are elaborated by the lips. So when I saw that, I said during one week, you will count from one to 50, the teeth close. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve, and the child feel that the sounds are elaborated by the lips. Uh, and uh, he do the difference between the uh, tongue uh, elocution and the lip elocution. And uh, the week after, I say, um, we can't speak the teeth closed. So you will speak normally. One, but you close the teeth between Shaq's number. One, I want to hear the clackment. Two, three, four, and you go faster and faster. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten, ten eleven, twelve, 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 and when you go faster, the tongue cannot go out and go out and go out and go and we feel it's more comfortable to stay inside and to give, to ask the lips to do the... But the two exercises I, yeah, I give uh, to emphasize uh, this uh, participation of the lips uh, in the elocution of a sound. I, I think that the key point also of the question of Valérie is what should they look when they are uh, watching the patients like that that is uh, speaking uh, what my father really focused on is that we should imagine that there is a border the border is the teeth and this border should never be crossed by the tongue if the tongue is crossing this border it means that the tongue is looking for the contact with the internal part of the cheeks or of the lips which is showing that we are still in primary swallowing. So we imagine that there is this border that is represented by the teeth. And what we should really be focusing at when we are looking at the video is, are, is the tongue oh, you crossing that? this border? Or is the tongue staying fully inside? Oh. And you've seen... This is like it's coming out of the side here. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. exactly. And it's deep. This is the origin of a deep bite. Not open bite, but the deep bite. That's the key moment. At this moment, we see that laterally, the tongue is going out of this border. It can be laterally, it can be anteriorly, it can be in any direction. The point is, is the tongue or not staying in its box, which is uh, having as border the uh, dental arcades, or is the tongue not respecting this border and going out? And when we see this at this moment, we know that the tongue do not respect this border. So we are still having a problem. We will be able to say that it's fine and that we are really on the good way when we do exactly the same and we never have the tongue going out of the box. I have an exercise, but I had no, no enough uh, time uh, uh, because uh, I ask generally uh, the parents uh, to control, as we have seen Ken Ma uh, no, uh, Bjork, uh, uh, the test, 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 just the patient, uh, the mother or the father says twice a day, oh, your lips are good. Uh, be careful, your lips are just two or three times, no more. And these are the tests, the tests, the tests. I permit to modify uh, the, motor, uh, the, the motor program by uh, the low brain, uh, by the cervelet, by the green matters, uh, and the loop. Uh, and to, and it's the, for me, it's very important to have this uh, control on the beginning uh, to uh, emphasize uh, the automatization of the good function. Yeah, the point of that is how to say if it's right or not. Place of the tongue is a very good uh, indication of that. The second key stuff I think that we should always be watching in every clinic, also when we are treating patients with uh, sleep apnea or sleep troubles, is the contractions of all the muscles of the face. So the contractions of the lips, of the cheeks, it's not very obvious with the beard, but the patients that will contract all of that will create the seal of the lips like that. And we will see all the okay. contraction of the face. And this is a clear indication that even though the mouth is closed, 
we know the tongue is at the wrong posture. If we are seeing those contractions, mm -hmm. it means for sure the tongue is at the wrong posture and we have to do something about that. I think, Valerie, to follow up, an exception would be in English phonetics, the TH sound. Are there certain sounds where... <clears throat> I think that the TH sound can fully be done without going, going out and crossing the border. But there's something very funny about their each language. It's uh, the work of Jean Dolaire, that was already, uh, also very well known in the Orthodontist uh, world. And uh, he was also showing that there's some dysmorphosis that are more common in some population because of the language spoken, because the way of speaking certain language can stimulate a little bit a pathology. Uh, can stimulate a little bit a pathology, but for the teach, as you may see, I am not enough uh, an English specialized uh, specialist, and I'm not having a good enough accent to be able and to say. I keep my French accent to prevent a disorder of my... <laughs> <laughs> so, so those are the questions from the chat. Any questions from the room? Well, well, well thank you again. This is very interesting. Thank you for your attention. Uh,